Hello and a very warm welcome to today's session brought to you by Team Bajos Exam Prep. I hope all of you are doing really well. Through the course of this lecture, we will be covering a very important component where a majority of your questions are actually concentrated and that's the unit on poetry. Uh, a lot of times we actually tend to ignore poetry, but poetry is like a huge uh, canvas that we are talking about. We need to cover rhetoric and prosody. We need to cover British poetry. We need to cover Indian poetry. We need to cover basically the world poets and all the questions are periodic being asked. There are a variety of questions that are usually coming from this particular unit, which makes it really interesting. And we'll be looking, of course, at this unit in greater detail today. So without further ado, I think let's just very, very quickly get started with today's session. Uh, there are some pivotal uh, aspects of poetry that I'll be telling you about uh, through the course of this particular video. Uh, so without further ado, I think let's just quickly, quickly kickstart today's session. Um, tomorrow is also going to be a sort of a follow up of this particular session. So you can read up more. Rather tomorrow, the first part, we will try to focus on the theoretical concepts as well. We'll try to focus on the theoretical concepts related to poetry. But always remember, like I said, most of your questions so out of the 10 units that we are talking about poetry is actually having the largest chunk of questions over 15 plus questions come directly from the unit on poetry that makes make uh, making sure that you know you need to definitely look at british poets you definitely need to cover world poetry you need to cover <coughs> um, so sorry you need to cover aspects of rhetoric and prosody as well in this particular process. So it's a very long term uh, initiative, cover poetry uh, step by step because you know you you can't really put it in one lump and, and do that. And we will try to help you out even more. Tomorrow's lecture, like I said, we'll also try and cover uh, some important theoretical concepts. I'll walk you through some important theoretical concepts. Uh, look at the ages. For instance, Elizabethan age is the age of drama, but it's also the age of poetry. Right? Elizabethan age is also the age of poetry romanticism is a movement in uh, you know which is which is actually considered uh, to be uh, facilitating poetry and getting poets at the forefront so we are in a position to see that poetry becomes a very important genre altogether and that's the reason it is a priority focused genre area that we'll be talking about right okay great good morning everybody good morning uh, i really love how some of you are always and always on time good morning everyone there's aziz there's divyani there's Saba. there's suman there's satya there's shalini prena good morning uh there's nidhi there's divyani divyani good morning uh there's literally first by mayang good morning bachi uh anam good morning manju seali shikha uh tehmina nidhi anna archana Kumal, Suman, Tehmina, Zamar, good morning. Bhache, Rajashri, good morning. Uh, Manju, good morning. Okay, okay, sorry. Manju is good morning. Uh, saying good morning to Suman. Okay, sorry. Uh, all right, good morning, everyone. Babita, Kuhu, uh, Liji, everyone. Wishing you a very happy, bright day today. Make sure that your weekends just sparkles bright and all of you are very, very happy and you make the most of your upcoming week as well. Okay, so without further ado, let's just very, very quickly now. Now dive into uh, the the proper subject area. Today we will look at uh, we will look at poetry. We will look at aspects of poetry, uh, and this we'll be doing it via some important questions. And tomorrow the first half. Tomorrow the first half we will focus on certain theoretical concepts of poetry. I'll be walking you through certain theoretical concepts of poetry. So today you can also probably read some more material along with whatever we'll do today. Uh, I, in the deck I'm having. 80 questions but we'll try to cover as many questions as possible so without further ado i think let's just quickly get started this is the first question who's the author of the house of fame the house of fame so don't forget your old english period don't forget your middle english period don't forget the age of joffrey chaucer so old english middle english age of joffrey chaucer net still gives you questions from these aspects as well and not just uh, simple questions you also get in-depth questions like questions on Beowulf, questions on uh, the other works that are written <clears throat> 
during the old english period middle english period even the crash course uh, we will be talking more about all these aspects as well okay absolutely right absolutely right so we we are having everybody in the chat box giving the right answer uh, that's right that's right that's right so a majority of you in the chat box are also giving the right answer which is fantastic right uh, so this is an easy question but it's important an allegorical poem by geoffrey chaucer it is written in octosyllabic couplets now this is also something that you have to remember house of fame it is written in octosyllabic couplets so what all what all was he actually writing in what was the writing pattern he is writing in octosyllabic couplets he is writing in octosyllabic couplets and you know chaucer's poem it is about a dream which the author is carried on by an eagle to the house of fame where he witnesses candidates seeking the throne of fame candidates are there to seek the throne of fame altogether so how he's carried by an eagle and written in octosyllabic couplet the style of writing make short little notes on uh, if the poets have written a lot of works what is the style of writing what is the prosodic meter that they are following uh, what is the analysis or are there any famous lines in that particular work altogether you should know about this and the next question is actually about lines the next question is about lines but we have done this question comes the blind fury with the abhorred shears and slits the thin spun life slits the thin spun life so this is actually to give you a hint taken from an elegy taken from a threnody taken from a monody again this is where your companions come in you should be looking at key terms every now and then either the penguin companion or the chris baldick edition of the oxford uh, literary companion to uh, sorry uh, your uh, oxford companion to literary terms what is the right answer vahida has answered it correctly lycidius is absolutely the right answer lycidius is the right answer it is a pastoral elegy it is commemorating the death of edward king right it's a pastoral elegy and it is written on the death of edward king so edward king's death what you are able to see is that this particular pastoral elegy is coming so all these aspects also have to be very clear here he is carried on by an eagle here he is carried on by an eagle it is written in octosyllabic couplet here he is commemorating the death of his young friend and this is a sort of a pastoral elegy that is being written and he is talking about how death is absolutely unjust right uh, particularly the the uh, unjust death of the mythical figure of lycidius right the shepherd lycidius he is a mythical figure that we are talking about so all the aspects have to be clear uh, allegro al penso rosso needs to be very clear all these aspects of course keep on becoming important okay statement 1 and statement 2 statement 1 and statement 2 all right let's just let's just see how many of you get the right answer here statement one and statement two you have to choose the correct option you have to yes absolutely right very good very good very good shalini <coughs> Let's see how many of you get the right answer. The theory of inscape and instress was given by. I have not uh, really received an answer here. Okay, okay. Some of you. Uh, okay, Nidhi is very close. Let's just take it. The theory of inscape and instress was introduced by Keats. Was it introduced by Keats or was it introduced by Hopkins? J. M. Hopkins, Gerard Manley Hopkins developed the theories of inscape and instress. So it is actually not, and we've we've done a session on Hopkins on YouTube platform only. On YouTube itself, we've done a session on Hopkins. If you just go back to that. So what we are able to see is Gerard Manley Hopkins is the person. All uh, right. Uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins is the person who is giving us so the statement is not correct so statement 1 is correct this will be eliminated uh, both statement 1 is correct this will be eliminated these two will be eliminated immediately these two will be eliminated immediately because this is not correct john keats is not giving this theory at all right john keats is not giving this particular theory and what is hopkins saying in stress refers to complex and distinctive qualities the complex qualities that are there the distinctive qualities that are there inherent in the nature of the thing the complex things which are there right you can even write this down you can even write this down right now what is how is uh, hopkins explaining in stress in stress refers to complex and distinctive qualities 
in stress is the complex and distinctive qualities complex as well as the distinctive qualities that are there within the thing distinctive qualities within the thing that is called an in stress that's an example of in stress the inherently which is there and what you are able to see is that the realization of an inscape of the others is a process which is uh, like you know uh, which is trying to tell you that how you are going towards god altogether so the second part is fine right the second part is absolutely fine that in stress refers to the experience of the inscape of things that is right that is right right so uh, b is the correct uh, answer uh, gm hopkins you will have to look at victorian poets as well this is an area this is a category that you cannot forget and in victorian era, uh, era poets you cannot focus uh, you cannot ignore uh, pre raphaelite brotherhoods you uh, pre raphaelite brother you can't just focus on only looking at tennyson and browning and forgetting the others because others are also coming in your exam so you will have to focus on all all, all of these as well okay please remember that the jaya theory was introduced by which writer was introducing the jaya theory so the jaya theory that is coming was getting introduced by which writer so jaya theory is a conception of history that is being purported in the poem called the second coming and what are you trying to talk about you are trying to look at uh, you know you are you are interpreting history in the form of cones that there is a gyre that there is a gyre that we are able to see that an epoch actually uh, culminates and the new era actually starts so the turbulent period is is predominantly starting yes absolutely right william butler yeats is the right answer william butler yeats in the second coming is also trying to help us understand the second coming the second coming you can i i also highly recommend all of you a uh, tomorrow rather i'll try to also use it use ignu books as well mg01 i think is on poetry uh, try to cover all the 10 booklets for sure before your uh, entrance right before your examination cover all the 10 booklets i'll try to see whether i can incorporate it either in the form of the app classes or the the 10:30 pm lectures or something i can probably help you out with do cover those um, they are also really important books that help you understand what are the important topics dulcet decorum est is a poem written by who's the writer dulcet decorum est is a poem written by who is the writer of dulce decorum est dulce decorum est who is writing this particular work who is the person associated with dulce decorum est dulce decorum est war poetry also needs to be very clear <clears throat> yes yes shikha absolutely right ravi jayas are cones so basically you are trying to say that history repeats itself that that's essentially the concept that you're able to see absolutely right oven is the right answer wilfred oven is the uh, the first world war uh, war poet dulce decorum est is is actually talking about the chlorine gas explosion and it's very sad because you know hours ago in delhi also 25 plus people according to some official reports 26 people according to another wire has said it or 27 uh, people have also uh, you know uh, unfortunately uh, uh, left for their heavenly abode why because there was a west delhi fire that had taken place right uh, but, but this is of course about war chlorine gas explosion uh, which is witnessed by the poet wilfred owen he's talking about how war is absolutely frightening there is a chlorine gas expo explosion so dulce decorum est it's sweet to die in war that's just a sort of a incorrect false myth that is perpetuated that is what he's trying to say war poets for both world war 1 poetry right world war 1 poetry and world war 2 poetry this is something that you will have to do in one of the free app sessions only while we were discussing about campus novels in india while we were looking at campus novels in india i think in that particular uh, class itself we had done a question on the second world war war poets also and the shift that you are able to see by the way <coughs> sorry the first world war war poets we are also able to see that the pacifist poetry is also coming from the pen of hardy thomas hardy rudyard kipling because kipling is also losing his own son then he also understand that understands that war is not very kind or very good so hardy kipling all of them are also trying to write uh, 
pacifist views altogether then georgian poetry edwardian poetry you need to make separate short little notes because you do get questions on uh, works like shropshire lad by hosman so the georgian poets the edwardian poets edwardian realistic writers uh, like uh, joseph conrad edward morgan foster rudyard kipling they are also equally important you will have to cover and make bit size notes on all of these topics and cover them end to end that is something which is really required okay so please keep that aspect in mind okay all right let's let's no worry sapna that's perfectly all right the anthology new lines is associated with the new lines anthology is getting associated with who is the new lines actually getting associated with the new lines is getting associated with can anyone quickly answer this particular question what is the right answer here <clears throat> new lines is associated with what with whom is new lines actually associated with new lines is getting associated with the anthology new lines that we are having is getting associated with the new lines Excellent, Ravi, Devyani, Nidhi, Bing, Tenzing, Surbi, Aziz. Everybody has answered it correctly. The movement actually refers to all the poets who were writing in the 1950s. They were actually publishing their poems in the anthology called New Lines. Writers like Kingsley Ames, John Wayne. Uh, you can make a list of this as well. So writers like Kingsley Ames, Kingsley Ames is coming over here. Right. Ah, uh, even Wayne is coming. John Wayne is there. John Wayne is there. All of these are your movement group of writers. Philip Larkin, Elizabeth Jennings, Elizabeth Jennings is there. This question actually comes in your exams also. Elizabeth Jennings. I think I will try to see. I'll try to cover all your Igno books also for some of ah uh, the classes that are coming up, especially for poetry, because that will be very helpful actually. Um, and Philip Larkin is very beautifully covered in the book as well. Ah, uh, so Philip Larkin is coming in. Right, Philip Larkin is there. Elizabeth Jennings is there. Richard Conquest is there. Richard Conquest is also writing. Richard Conquest, all of these poets: Richard Conquest, Elizabeth Jennings, Philip Larkin, John Wayne, Kingsley Ames. They are all a part. They are all a part of your movement poets, right? They are all a part of your movement poets. Movement poetry is a criticism of romantic poetry. right so what you are able to see is that uh, that they are trying to talk about everyday experiences of working class british people the kind of everyday experiences what is the subject what is the main subject of these poets the main subject of these poets is they want to talk about everyday lives of the british working class they are trying to completely talk about literature as being meant uh, uh, you know they're, they're trying to disassociate literature from the elite connotations that literature had so the everyday experiences the everyday experiences that you are having of the working class people the everyday experiences of the working class people that is becoming a priority working class everyday experiences kingsley ames john wayne elizabeth jennings philip larkin richard conquest all of them and their uh, the anthology that they are getting their works published in is called the new lines <clears throat> the anthology is called the new lines okay please remember that Which of the following is an example of Pindaric codes? Horatian notes, Pindaric codes again, part of rhetoric and prosody that you're talking about. The types, the classifications. Majority of questions in poetry are coming from there itself, right? So, uh, where are we able to see? Where are we able to see? The 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 example of Pindaric code clearly shown to us. Please make structured notes for this particular class also, because by the end of it, uh, depending upon how many questions we cover, there will still be uh, an abundant portion of uh, understanding that you know what you have to cover when it comes to uh, looking at your uh, poetry section. You'll get more idea and clarity altogether. Excellent, very good, very good. Some of you have answered it correctly. I could see A uh, being answered by many of you who all had answered it. Nidhi, Lidhi, Rashri, Ravi. Very good, very good, very good. That is the right answer. So, 1757 Progress of Poetry is coming by Thomas Gray, which is an example of Pindaric Ode, right? Progress of po Poetry by Thomas Gray. Thomas Gray is also graveyard poet. Graveyard school of poetry is also an important aspect that we are able to look at. he is famously also termed as um, as your sort of graveyard poet and progress of poetry that we are looking at it's an example of pindaric work 1757 is when it's coming so you should also know the publication dates when is it coming 1757 is when it's coming uh, also please remember in this particular poem gray is tracing the progress of poetic art 
from the classical times to the contemporary times progress of poesy progress of poetry and the poem is having reference uh, to shakespeare to milton to dryden he is comparing shakespeare milton dryden there is re there are references to shakespeare there are references to uh, milton there are references to dryden that are being made so he is trying to look at the progress of poetry from classical times from classical times all the way till contemporary times he is trying to give us a sort of a proper understanding of how poetry is developing the poem is having references like i said to dryden shakespeare milton and he's trying to understand that you know the structure of poem uh, this poem uh, progress of poesy is actually very similar to the pindaric ode the pindaric ode was composed in triple units or a group of 3 units with strophe anti strophe of the same construction and an epod strophe was there anti strophe was there i'll just use a different colored pen so pindaric ode you can even write this down about the pindaric ode you should also ideally know that when we are looking at the pindaric ode the pindaric ode had a triple part structure right the pindaric odes had triple units or a group of triple units there were triple units that you were able to see these are the units of uh, of a ode as well that we are talking about right so the strophe and antistrophe the strophe and antistrophe are of the same length the strophe and antistrophe are of the same length and the epod is there and the epod is there and the epod is also coming in epod is a different structure so these are the three parts of the pindaric ode the pindaric ode the horatian odes what are odes how are they different what are the new kinds of odes that are being written the modern ode how the the genre of ode is actually developing transforming what are the various examples that we are having all of these are important okay all of these become important you will have to cover all of those so uh, please remember that because a lot of times i think we go wrong with these kind of questions which we ideally shouldn't right which we ideally shouldn't so i hope uh, you will be able to keep this in mind that a uh, th uh, uh, thomas gray's progress of poesy 1757 it is trying to tell us from classical times to contemporary times the development of poesy he talks about shakespeare milton dryden uh, it is very similar to the pindaric ode which had triple format structure strophe and ant these trophy were of the same construction they were of the same construction but epod had a different structure epod had a different structure altogether right so ode as a genre needs to be studied the term pylon poets derives from the poem by who uh, so pylon poets that we are talking about here it's a very tricky question but let's just see how many of you are able to grab the right answer here let's just figure out how many of you uh, are able to get the right answer so we'll 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 just quickly look at that Yes 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 okay nice 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 Okay, fantastic. That is the right answer. That is the right answer. So, Pylon poets is actually uh, the name that we are giving to a group of poets, ordinary group of poetry, is as it is important. Stephen Spender is absolutely the right answer. So, Pylon poets, also called Pink poets, also called the Oxford group of poets, also called Max Conde group of poets, right? Pylon poets were a group of British poets who wrote uh, in the 1930s, and their work was dealing with modern condition, right? What were they dealing with? They were dealing with modern condition. And and they often featured industrial imagery they were talking about industrial imagery so stephen spender had written this poem called the pylons stephen spender all of them are pylon poets by the way mind you all of them are pylon poets but stephen spender had written the mysterious poem called the pylons so he had written this poem this work called the pylons remember even in class we had an elementary school classroom in a slum by stephen spender where he was literally telling you about the slum conditions altogether these are oxford poets they are also socialist poets um, they are having left wing ideology or sympathies um wh orden they are also called orden group of poets also called orden group of poets basically these are poets of the 1930s who are getting influenced by socialism that they have studied at oxford university so the socialism as a way to bring in equality in the society that they have studied the max ponde group is there modernism can also be covered by edward albert that really clears a lot of your concepts the way that it's beautiful given also um that really helps all together 
okay yes roy campbell is talking about it excellent excellent who's this literary first by mayank as well as shalini we have actually done this question also by roy campbell in the application uh lectures of pre-app sessions also we've actually done this particular practice question if you remember excellent bang on right let's move on to the next question and let's see how many of you are able to get the right answer here spencerian stanza is used by shelley in which work shelley is using the spencerian stanza in which work in which work are we able to see that Shelley is uh, managing to use the Spencerian stanza in which work in which work are we able to see that Shelley is using the Spencerian stanza the Spencerian stanza form <coughs> sorry Let me place this here to look at your comments better. Okay, anyway. Excellent. Fantastic. That That is the right answer. That is the right answer. Okay, great, great, great. So, Spencerian stanza, remember it's having eight lines in iambic pentameter followed by one line in alexandrine or iambic hexameter. So, how many lines are there uh, predominantly in Spencerian stanza form? We are having eight lines of iambic uh, pentameter and the ninth line is in iambic hexameter, right? This is in iambic hexameter. This is in iambic hexameter iambic hexameter and the eight lines they are there in iambic pentameter they're there in iambic pentameter pentameter iambic pentameter iambic hexameter what is the ninth line also called the ninth line is also called alexandrine the ninth line is also called alexandrine or serpentile or it is also called serpentile right so it's called alexandrine it's also called serpentile that is the way, way we are defining it what is the rhyme scheme of the spencerian stanza it's a b a b b c b c c right a b a b so you can just remember it like that a b a b b c b c c right so b c b c c b c b c c that is the uh, uh one two three four five six seven eight nine yeah so this is the rhyme scheme that you are having of the spencerian stanza form it was introduced by edmund spencer the fairy queen and it was used by shelley in his adonis right shelley was using it in his adonis remember we also were talking about mobla uh being written by shelley in the very recent classes only i think uh we, we talked about that so keep on compiling that is how you update your notes all together now one more work of shelley comes in so that is how you're going to update all your notes william blake's famous poems such as london the sick rose sick rose we, we had done this very recently in one of the lectures only in the free sessions only we've done it the tiger they appear where are they appearing where are these works appearing where are we able to see these writings where is it that we're able to see these writings uh london the sick rose the tiger where are they appearing where where are we able to see that these writings are coming in let's see let's see how many of you get the right answer here let's this is a really simple question all of you should get it right neha bakat has given the right answer bharat das apriyanka anamali varsi everybody is right nithi juhi sabha wahida everybody has got the right answer this is songs of experience that we are talking about this is songs of experience that we are talking about songs of experience 26 poems are coming forming the second part of songs of innocence and experience they were getting published in 1794 london London uh, is, of course, the setting of most of these. And, you know, Blake was the first generation poet who never left outside London. He's a romantic poet who never went outside London. The sick rose is actually trying to tell you about uh, the symbols of rose, the warm, uh, the intense experience uh, of un unpolluted innocence, right? The kind of, uh, th this, this is always going to be there, unpolluted innocence, virgin territory, unpolluted innocence, not getting corrupted. These are all the enlightenment ideas. These are also all the romantic ideas that we are having, right? That we are able to see. Uh, enlightenment, romanticism, you really have to understand all of that. Tiger. Uh, uh, again, it is an important work which is telling you about uh, the tiger and the lamp. Lamp is the the counterpart in the songs of innocence a very innocent tiger is a burning anger which is required next question is very simple the term kirtle sonnet was coined by who is the person coining the term kirtle sonnet who is the person coining the term kirtle sonnet the term kirtle sonnet was coined by this particular term kirtle sonnet is getting coined by who is the person who is coining the term kirtle sonnet 
Kirtle sonnet is is a term which is being coined by who is the person associated with the term Kirtle sonnet? <coughs> very good very good very good very good so kurtle sonnet is actually by jm hopkins right uh, it's used in three of his poems also it uh, specifically refers to an 11 line sonnet form right it, it refers to 11 line sonnet form that we're talking about right uh, a b c a uh, sorry a b c a b c this is also how you can actually remember it a b c a b c so kurtle sonnet is again by hopkins right in scape in stress we just uh, spoke about in today's class that's also hopkins right uh, so curtail sonnet is curtailed sonnet you are you're leaving it it's an 11 line sonnet or it uh, or three fourth of a real sonnet it's also called three fourth of a real sonnet right what is a real sonnet real sonnet is also called a petrarchan sonnet of eight and four uh, eight and six lines right it is three fourth of a real sonnet so remember your mathematics three by four into eight this becomes 6 and 3 by 4 into 6 this will be 2 and this will be 3 so it is 9 by 2 which is 4.5 so uh, it is 3 by 4 of a real sonnet mathematically it is 3 by 4 so it is a 10 and a half line sonnet uh, which is also called the 11 line sonnet form it is a curtailed sonnet it is a curtailed sonnet that we are talking about that is a curtail sonnet curtailed sonnet is curtail is like you you have ended that you have ended it you've curtailed the speech altogether it was invented by hopkins uh, and it was used by him in three of his writings uh, we are able to see the rhyme scheme abc abc you can also remember the rhyme scheme what is the rhyme scheme that is being followed abc abc these are the first six lines uh, mostly and uh, dcb dc dcb uh, dcb dc uh, dcb dc dcb dc uh, this is also but there is another uh, there is another uh, format also dcb dc but there is another format also uh, that is used as rhyme scheme uh, abc abc uh, dbc dc dbc dc so sometimes they change it to that also uh, now this particular work is actually written in iambic pentameter the iambic pentameter is there and the final line has a single spondy the single spondy is there so these all aspects also they can give you that which among the following is not true for a curtail sonnet so you should ideally remember okay moving on to so i hope it is absolutely clear that here we are able to see that uh, that uh, jm hopkins was a person who was associated with the curtail sonnet let's move on to the next question you have to match the following this is the kind of stanza and these are the kind of poems that we are talking about let's just quickly match the uh, do the match the following very good, very good, Moshmi Das. Absolutely right. Moshmi, very good. Moshmi Das is giving the right answers. Pied Beauty, very nice. Good. Shout out for Moshmi Das. Very nice, Pichay. Very good. God bless you. Very nice, very nice. Okay, what is the right answer here? What is the right answer here? Let's just see. You have to match the kinds of stanzas which are there and the poems which are there. The kinds of stanzas that we are having and the kinds of poems that we are having. Let's just see how many of you get the right answer. Excellent, excellent. Nidhi, Shikha, uh, Neha Bakar, Wahida, Divyani, Zahida, Juhi, Zia Kureshi, Kanupriya, Pandey, Surbi, Ravi, Roots and Legacies, Lichi. Very good. Excellent, excellent. Right. Uh, that's the right answer. Uh, so if you look at it, uh, we're able to see a stanza is actually a group of uh, verses lines in a poem. Uh, usually the stanza of a given poem is actually uh, also having uniform lines all together. So when you're looking at the the stanza forms what kind of verse what kind of verse formation would you have what kind of verse formation would you have so if you look at the couplet form couplet are two pairs a marvels uh, to his coy mistress you are able to see uh, it is written in the couplet form the graves a fine and private place but none i think do there embrace right remember the lines the graves a fine and private place but none i think do there embrace so uh, that is the couplet that you are having to his coy mistress so a is 4 a is 4 in uh, two options so you can actually eliminate you can actually eliminate this particular option then triplet is three line stanza form uh, the lines you are able to see richard crashaw wishes to his sup uh, supposed mistress richard crashaw is writing wishes to his supposed mi mistress this is by richard crashaw i have repeated multiple times that you cannot ignore 17th century literature 17th century literature is a very vast panorama and 17th century poetry is very very important 17th century poetry 17th century prose, 17th century drama. You cannot 
not ignore the 17th century at all. You will have to cover and give your uh, selves a little bit of time. So wishes to his supposed mistress is written in a triplet format, uh, where he is coming and writing, who's uh, uh, who, whoever she be, that not impossible she that shall command my heart and me. Uh, she will command my heart and me. Terza Rima is uh, when we are able to see that you know uh, this is basically having terse sets. There are three lines which are there. There are terse sets that are coming in. That's your terza Rima. Uh, the the three lines that are there, the terse sets that are there. That's your terza Rima which comes in. Uh, so so that is what you are able to see. A B A B C B C D C. Uh, Shelley's Ode to the West Wind. O oh, wild West Wind. Thou breathe autumn's being. Um, right and then it just continues. So uh, that's your terza Rima that we are talking about. O to the West Wind is an example over here that you are able to see. And quatrain format is a four line stanza form that you are having. And this is used by Gray in Elegy written in a country churchyard. So you have actually done two works of Thomas Gray unknowingly through the course of this lecture only. So that is what I'm saying that, you know, uh, these practice sessions also, if you compile your notes together, if you are putting them together in a proper manner, then these sessions would be helpful. But if you're not doing it properly, then obviously these sessions wouldn't be uh, as effective at all. So quatrain is something that is written in elegy, written in a country churchyard. So if you look at it, B was uh, B was three. B was 3. Uh, B is not 3 over here. So A is the right answer. Most of you had given A only as the right answer, which is the correct option. So I hope the stanza forms are absolutely clear. Couplet, again, to quickly revise, we're able to see that uh, to his coy mistress is writ written in the couplet form. Triplet is something which is being used in uh, wishes to his supposed mistress uh, by Richard Crashaw. Terza Rima is being used by uh, P.B. Shelley in Ode to the West Wind. And Elegy written in a country churchyard is using the the quatrain style of writing. It is using the quatrain style of writing. Moving on to the next question. In 1961, at the inauguration of President John F. Kennedy, who became the first poet to read a poem at the presidential inauguration? And what is the title of the poem? This is a, a question which has also been asked not once but twice in your exams indirectly in different ways. What is the right answer here? Let's just see how many of you get the right answer here. Let's just quickly, quickly see how many of you are able to. Very good. Very good. That is the right answer. That is the right answer. So when Robert Frost became the first poet to read uh, in the program of presidential inauguration in 1961, he was already well regarded in United States, obviously because of the kind of philosophy he had, the kind of works that he was writing. And what you are basically able to see. So this, this, this part, of course, becomes important. Please remember that. And uh, you are able to see the gift outright is a poem by Frost. Frost first recited it. Uh, on December 5th, 1941, and it became one of the most famous recitation occurred uh, that had occurred. Uh, and uh, it was also being used. So, uh, you know, these kind of uh, situational questions also have started coming in and you should actually know about it. And here, Robert Frost is absolutely the right answer. The gift of uh, the gift outright, Robert Frost. This is... <clears throat> The, uh, he is the first poet to read a poem at the presidential inauguration. Even recently, um, you know, if, if you just look at any of the recent presidential elections, poets have been invited, stars, actors, uh, artists have been invited. That just adds a lot of value altogether. Okay. All right. The word mythopoeia means myth making and has been used in English since at least 1846. Mythopoeia is a poem by. Mythopoeia is a poem by. Mythopoeia becomes a poem. By which particular writer are we talking about? So, you know, mythopoeia is actually coming from Hellenistic Greek. Mythopoeia, myth making. Right. It's, it's coming from Hellenistic. Where is the word coming in from? It's coming in from Hellenistic Greek because a lot of times you get questions. Where is the a word coming from? Mythopoeia is coming from Hellenistic Greek. It's coming from Hellenistic Greek. Right. Uh, and, and what is mythopoeia? It's creating of myth. It's creating of myth altogether, making myths altogether. It was also adapted by, it was adapted by Tolkien. Absolutely right. J.R.R. Tolkien was using it as a title to his poems, uh, which he had published in Tree and Leaf. Uh, in 1931, J.R.R. Tolkien was using it. J.R.R. Tolkien was actually using mythopoeia. 
right mythopoeia was being used it means myth making basically the imagist movement was inspired by the aesthetic philosophy of the imagist poets again these are important categories and they still come these questions are still coming that is the reason i'm saying poetry is where a bulk of your questions are concentrated and it's a very scoring unit it's not that it's difficult to score all together it's a very very scoring unit what is the right answer here let's just see Let's just check out how many of you get the right answers. Sorry. All right, what's the right answer? I was just switching up the AC. It's getting a little cold. What is the right answer, everyone? Yes, that is the right answer. That is absolutely the right answer that most of you have actually given. So, images poetry, which is trying to condense the style of writing, which is trying to condense the works that are coming in. Uh, you have uh, that you know they were actually getting inspired by T. E. Hulme's philosophy. Hulme was talking about his dissatisfaction with contemporary English poetry, and he was talking about hard and precise images. He said that you know we need to use hard and precise images. uh what was he trying to suggest what was his suggestion hard and precise images have to be used that is what he was saying and remember it was also getting influenced by your uh, japanese haiku poetry it was also getting influenced by your japanese haiku poetry the baro is a poem in 24 letters by who is the writer associated with the baro who is the writer associated with the baro The Baro is a work which is a collection of twenty-four poems. It's getting published in eighteen ten, right? It's coming in eighteen ten. Eighteen ten is when the Baro is coming, right? Eighteen ten is when the Baro is coming. So Baro is a collection of poems. The poems are written in heroic couplet also, and they're organized as twenty-four letters that cover the details of life, people, tradition, who are living in Adelberg, who are living in Adelberg, people who are living in Adelberg. Suffolk, Adelberg. So it is trying to tell you about all the people in Suffolk, Adelberg. Okay, what is the right answer here? Absolutely right. George Crabbe is the right answer. George Crabbe is the right answer. So please remember that you know uh, th this is something that we also did very recently. So the Baro is a collection of poems. It was first coming in eighteen ten. It was first coming in eighteen uh, ten. So always remember your uh, your uh, trans uh, transitional poets, your transitional poets, your romantic poets. They have to be done properly because you do get questions coming in, and George Crabbe is one such poet. So in 1810 is when we are able to see that the Baro is coming by George Crabbe, and it is written in in 24 letters which are coming in that are telling you about life, people, tradition who are there in the uh, town of Adelberg. They're all there in the town of Adelberg, Suffolk, and uh, it was uh, you know there's a question that comes in how long did this work take? The the work took eight years. The work took eight years. So it took eight years to actually write this piece of writing. It took eight years for him to actually write this piece of writing. It took him eight years to cover this up. Which of the following is a collection of poems by Margaret Atwood? Atwood's collection of poetry. So Margaret Atwood is also associated with poetry writing. Margaret Atwood is writing a collection of poetry, which is that it's divided into five sections, telling you about old age, approaching mortality, authorial popularity, the craft of writing. Right. Uh, also, environmental issues. By the way, environmental issues are also being considered. Environmental issues are also being considered. <coughs> Sorry. What is the right answer here? Very good. That is the right answer. So Margaret Atwood's the door. Margaret Atwood's the door is the right answer here. Uh, right. Door is a collection of poems that was coming in two thousand and seven. So in two thousand and seven, Atwood is associated with the poetry collection called the door. Uh, book is having five sections. It's telling you about old age. It's telling you about approaching death, mortality, author's popularity, the craft of writing, and the poems are uh, also you know a brilliant example. 
example of Margaret Atwood's take on environmental issues as well. Uh, Margaret Atwood's take on environmental issues as well. John Garver's Confessio Amantis is written in. Confessio Amantis is a work which is coming in which language? Confessio Amantis is a work of writing which is coming in which language? Middle English poet John Garver was writing in French, Latin, English. Uh, his first work is Speculum Menditantus. Speculum Menditantus is the first work that we are having. Speculum Men. Menditantus is the first work. Menditantus is the first work that he's coming up with. And uh, Speculum Menditantus is written in French. The second work is Vox Clementis. This is coming in the French period. This is coming in the French period. Vox Clementis is the work. Absolutely right. Most of you are giving the right answer. Vox Clementis is written in Latin, right? Vox Clementis is written. Vox Clementis is written in Latin. Vox Clementis is written in Latin. Right now, only revise it. And Confessio Mantis is written in English. Confessio Mantis, the Confessions of a Lover, it is, uh, you know, it is written in English. So you have the French phase, you have the Latin phase, you have the English phase, just like even in Chaufri Chaucer, it's the French, Italian and English. Here it's French, Latin and English, French, Latin and English in the case of John Gower, a contemporary of Geoffrey Chaucer. So first is Speculum Menditantis written in French, second is Vox Clementis written in Latin, third is Confessio Mantis written in, in uh, English. And Confessio Mantis is a collection of short stories, narratives which is telling you about love life um all these aspects are actually getting covered okay moving on to which uh, which of the following poem is not a work by john dunn it is not a work by john dunn which work is not by John Donne? We've actually done this. Uh, uh, John Donne is, of course, classified as a metaphysical poet, but this particular work is written by a Caroline poet. Caroline poet writing during the Caroline period. Caroline period, 1625 to 1649, particularly. This is called the Caroline Age or the Age of Charles the First. right? It's also called the Caroline period, right? Very good. Very good. That C is the right answer. To Althea from Prison is by Richard Lovelace, right? To Althea from Prison is written by Richard Lovelace. Richard Lovelace. So George Crabbe's writings that we looked at, uh, Crashaw's writing that we looked at to his supposed mistress. So these are all the works. Uh, so you, you need to revise all of that, right? So here we are able to see that Richard Crashaw is the person who's associated with two, uh, sorry, um, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry, Richard Lovelace uh, is associated with the work uh, to Althea from prison, right? Richard Lovelace is the person who's writing this. Richard Lovelace is the person, Lovelace is the person who's writing it to Althea from prison. The famous lines which are there, uh, all the important works of John Donne, Death Be Not Proud, Good Morrow, Canonization, Plea, they're all extremely important. And of course, they, they come in your exams, right? So you need to be very carefully worried about, uh, like, concentrating your energies there. Okay, moving on, a damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It is a line from which work? It is a line from which work that we're talking about? This is a line coming from which work that we're able to see? Nice, nice, nice. So don't even forget the earlier, uh, you know, types of writings that are coming in. Yes, absolutely right. Absolutely right. So this is, these are lines taken from Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Kubla Khan. Vahida, everybody before that also has given the right answer. And according to Coleridge, the poem is a result of an opium-induced dream uh, that he once had, right? And in this vision, he saw Kubla Khan, who's the Mongolian emperor. He builds this lavish palace in, in the state of Zanado. Uh, you know, Coleridge's poem is about creativity of the ruler and uh, it's, it's also talking about creative genius of a poet creativity of a ruler creative genius of a writer that is what he's actually discussing right so damsel with the dulcimer in a vision once i saw in a vision once i saw in a vision once i saw kubla khan how many pilgrims meet at chaucer's canterbury tales now this is actually i don't know why all of you make it a frantic thing there is nothing to worry about uh basically what happens is how um this comes across as 31 is predominant dominantly because there are 29 pilgrims then there is uh there is the narrator who's there or the host who's there and there is chaucer by that particular logic it comes out to 31 and that is the reason why in most of the exams when this question has come they've given 31 as a priority if you dig deeper then of course you come to know more about it but uh, you can you can go with this particular safer option here 
okay so we will not spend too much of time here which of the following is not a poem from eliot's four quatrains for eliot's four quatrains this question definitely mostly is coming these days in your exams you should ideally know about the four quatrains that we are looking at so ts eliot's four quatrains is a collection of four poems burnt norton east coker right uh, which all are a part of it let's just see how many of you are able to write it uh, how many of you are able to give the right answer here and then we'll quickly discuss it Right, right. So uh, D is the right answer. So T. S. Eliot's four quatrains is having four poems: Burn Norton, East Coker, The Dry Salvages, and Little Giddy. Right. These are the four parts that are there. Uh, they're trying to tell you about man's relationship with the world altogether. That is the the ultimate thing. Uh, hysteria is not a part of it. And which one is missing over here? We are able to see that Little Giddy is missing. Little Giddy is missing. Right. so all of these are a part of the four quatrains all of these are a part of four quatrains right all of these become a part of the four quatrains burn norton east coker dry salvages little gidding song of myself i sing the body electric and out of the cradle endlessly rocking are poems uh, from the collection by this is a very very simple question very very simple question but you will have to look at 19th century american poets you do get questions coming on that and he is a writer who's really inspiring a huge uh, legacy of writers all together with the free verse style of writing that was coming in what is the right answer here Yes, Sapna, absolutely right. Yes, absolutely right. It's Walt Whitman. We will not spend a lot of time. Free verse is something that he is inventing, properly looking at, and free verse becomes really popular over here. So that is of course important. Okay, moving on to the next question. Which of the following is not an example of a mock epic? It is not an example of a mock epic. It is not basically a mock epic that we are having. So which of the following is not an example of a mock epic? Mock epics are satirizing classical conventions. they are telling you about trivial themes all together and they are trying to tell you about the absurdity which comes in because you are trying to exaggerate the heroic qualities you are trying to exaggerate the heroic qualities you are you are producing laughter you are producing ridicule all together that is what you are doing so who all are associated over here who all are associated over here mock epics what are they trying to do mock epics are trying to satirize the classical traditions absolutely right absolutely right the conquest of granada is the right answer the rest are all mock epics the rest are all mock epics are trying to trivialize are trying to satirize right the conquest of granada is a heroic tragedy the conquest of granada it is a heroic tragedy rather it's not a mock epic it's a heroic tragedy that we are talking about it's not a mock epic at all Okay, which of these poems by Keats is set in the Middle Ages? It is set in the Middle Ages. It's coming from the Middle Ages altogether. It's actually deriving its essence from the Middle Ages. Which work are we talking about? It's set in the medieval period, uh, medieval ages. Medievalism was very popular with the Romantic poets altogether. Uh, which work is that? And you know, it's telling you about two lovers and the relationship between two lovers, Madeline and Porphyria. So there is Madeline there, and there is Porphyria who's there. So Madeline is there, and we are also having Porphyria. So it's literally trying to tell you the. uh porphyria porphyria is there madeline is there so these are the two lovers that you are having porphyro uh and it's literally trying to tell you about courtly love tradition so what is the right answer the eve of saint agnes is the right answer which most of you are giving it right uh please look at all the writings of john keats john keats does come in your exams you do get questions coming in uh, from john keats so do remember that we look before and after and find for what is not we look before and after and find for what is not we look before and after and find for what is not are lines from which poem these are lines which are coming from which poem we look before and after and find for what is not and find for what is not what is the right answer here we look before and after and find for what is not what is the right answer here very simple question not that difficult at all right not that difficult at all let's just see how many of you are able to get the right answer 
Yes, Ravi Pandey has given the right answer. Suman, Nidhi, Neha Bakat, everybody is right. Dharmendra, Bibi Shelley to a Skylark is having the 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 famous lines we look before and after and find for what is not. So this is to a Skylark that we're talking about. This is to a Skylark that we're we're looking at. This is Bibi Shelley's to a Skylark. PB Shelley is to a Skylark that we are uh, basically looking at. Now, to a Skylark is an ode from the poet uh, which was coming in, uh, from the 1820 collection Prometheus Unbound, a lyrical drama and four acts. That is where uh, it was coming in from. This question can also come that to a Skylark is an ode from which collection from the 1820 collection Prometheus Unbound. Which is also an example of closet drama because very uh, recently we did a question on closet drama. Remember? A lyrical drama and four acts with other poems. So, To a Skylark is written with Prometheus Unbound. And in this work, the poet is celebrating the beauty of the Skylark song. Through similes, through metaphors, he is trying to celebrate the Skylark song altogether. He is trying to celebrate that the Skylark song. Okay, moving on to the next question. Will a shepherd is the narrator of which work? Will the shepherd is the narrator of which writing? Will will the shepherd is a narrator of which poem? Of which poem are we able to see that will is a... Uh, is actually the narrator. Will a shepherd is the narrator of the poem? Which which work are we talking about? Absolutely right. Pius the Plowman is the right answer. Zahida answered it correctly. Zahida answered it. Yes, yes, yes. Prince is like my favorite ode. It is. It's beautifully written. It's beautifully, beautifully written. Uh, right. So, uh, so here you're able to see Pius the Plowman often, uh, often associated with William Langland. It's written. It's a Middle English poem that we're talking about, composed in alliterative verse. Right. Alliterative verse is something which is being used over here. Uh, alliterative verse is being used. You have the A text. You have the B text. You have the C text. This question also comes in, by the way, there are three principal versions. There are three principal versions of the work. What are the three principal versions of the work? We are having the A text, which is there. We are having the B text, which is there. And we are having the C text, which are there. These are the three principal versions that we have. And the prologue to the poem starts with the lines uh, altogether that, you know, that is introducing Will. He's uh, roaming the world. He's dressed as a shepherd. He's roaming the world and he's dressed as a shepherd altogether. That is what you're able to look at so uh, please keep that in mind um yeah, this is the right answer. Milton wrote Lycidius in the memory of Milton was writing Lycidius in the memory of Milton wrote Lycidius in the memory of <clears throat> Milton was writing Lycidius in the memory of He was writing, we, we just did this question, by the way, pastoral elegy, the lines that we did, the second question that we did. So we, we talked about Edward King, right? We talked about Edward King. So uh, Edward King over here is the right answer. So uh, Milton was writing, Milton was writing Lycidius in the memory of Edward King. Uh, so this was the, uh, the pastoral elegy that he was writing. Okay. Let's move on. The Rhyme Royale consists of, Rhyme Royale written by Geoffrey Chaucer as well. What is it consists of? What is Rhyme Royale consisting of? What is it that Rhyme Royale consists of? It is having seven lines. Remember, there are seven lines. A, B, A, B, B, uh, A, B, A, B, B, C, C, A, B, a, B, B, C, C. It's a seven line stanza form. That's the rhyme royale for you. It is also called Chaucerian stanza uh, because Chaucer was using it in English for the very first time. What is the right answer here? Right. Absolutely right. It's having seven iambic pentameter, right? It's having seven iambic pentameter. Seven iambic pentameter is the right answer. It is a seven line stanza form in iambic pentameter stanza. Seven line stanza form, seven line stanza form in iambic pentameter meter it is also called Chaucerian stanza form Chaucerian stanza form so today we did house of fame which was written in octosyllabic couplet house of fame was written in octosyllabic couplet and Chaucerian stanza form this is what we are talking about so please remember that okay the elegy when lilacs last in dooryard bloomed when lilacs last in dooryard bloomed was written to commemorate the death of was written to commemorate the death of was written to commemorate the death of <clears throat> Sorry. What is the right answer here? What is the right answer here? Let's just see how many of you get the right answer here. Abraham Lincoln. Shrika has got the right answer. Divyani has got the right answer. 
Very good, very good, very good. Yes, Charlie, it was introduced by James the First. That's right. When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloom, it's a pastoral elegy written by Walt Whitman uh, because Abraham Lincoln was assassinated on April 14th. Uh, so that is the reason he'd actually written this entire work. So Abraham Lincoln is the right answer here. Death of Abraham Lincoln. John Byron's Don Juan is composed in. Byron's Don Juan is composed in. It is composed in. Don Juan is composed in. It's an epic satire, Don Juan. It's about legendary character who's seduced by, easily seduced by women. And Byron's poem is having 16 cantos written in, written in, written in. This epic satire, uh, it's, it's having 16 cantos. It's the epic satire that we're talking about. It's the epic satire that we're talking about. And it's written in 16 cantos. It's written in, uh, absolutely right. It is Otava Raima. Otava Raima is the one which is being used. Otava Raima is the one which is being used. Neha Bakat is on fire. Good. Which of the following poets is not a part of Oxford group? Not a part of Oxford group. Very simple because we just did this question also. The Pylons is a work written by Stephen Spender with the, with the name, Max, uh, you know, uh, where the name of Pylon Poets is coming. Max Ponde group is what Roy Campbell calls it. This is what we just did uh, as well. What is the right answer here? W.H. Auden, Stephen Spender, Cecil Day-Lewis, Louis McNeese, all of these were people, they had leftist ideas, they were having leftist ideas. W.S. Graham is the right answer, he's the odd one out, right? New Lines, Movement Poets, this is what we had looked at today, right? New Lines, Movement Poets, then Max von der Group, Poets of the 1930s. Here, Elizabeth Jennings is coming, Wayne is, John Wayne is coming, Philip Larkin is coming, New Lines, Movement Poetry, Kingsley Amos is coming, right? All of those you, you need to keep in mind, uh, Richard, Richard Conquest is coming. Nizam Ezekiel was awarded the Sahitya Academy Award and this is your homework also today. I really want you to also focus on Indian poetry uh, because a lot of times we forget Indian poetry and questions do come in. Rather tomorrow we'll try to start somewhere from here. Nizam Ezekiel was awarded the Sahitya Academy for he was uh, awarded the Sahitya Academy for, I think this is a question that we've done multiple times. So he was awarded it for later day thousands, right? Uh, that is the right answer. It's having, telling about religious, philosophical poems. Uh, but Indian experience is something which is coming in. Uh, on the best portion of Goodman's life, his life nameless, unremembered acts of kindness, of love, which poem do these lines occur in? Right? Where are we able to see these lines coming in? Where where are these lines coming in? Where are we able to see these lines coming in? Very good. Very good. Yes. D is the right answer. D is the right answer. These are lines uh, which are coming from Tintin Abbey. Wordsworth as it is has to be uh, done multiple times. So these lines have been quoted by Wordsworth in Tintin Abbey. Wordsworth had written during his visits to the bank of River Wye when he was going back to the River Wye. Right. Uh, so when he was going back to the River Wye, that is when he penned down these words it's about a deep connection that he shares uh, with nature that was influencing him. The way that nature was influencing him, that is also coming about over here. So please remember that. Let's come on to another question from Indian poetry. Savitri is a poem written by. Savitri is a poem, a legend and a symbol. A legend and a symbol. What is the subtitle? A legend and a symbol. A legend and a symbol. This is Savitri. A legend and a symbol. Savitri. That is the complete title. The poem is based on the episode of Mahabharata. We'd also talked about Draupadi being translated by Mahashweta Devi, being translated by Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak in the question that we did last night. Um, what is this based on? It's based on the episode from the Mahabharata and it's telling you about the poet's vision of poetry and mankind. It is by Sri Aurobindo. It is by Sri Aurobindo. So he's telling you about the vision for a poet as as well as what is his vision for poetry, what is his vision for poetry, what is his vision for poets altogether. That is something that he's discussing. Okay, uh, that is the right answer. Moving on to the next question very, very quickly. John Dryden celebrates the year dash as uh, in Annus Mirabilis. Which year is he celebrating? Which year is John Dryden actually celebrating? So, Annus Mirabilis celebrates the year where, which is called the year of miracles as, as well, because Britain won the second Dutch war. The fire of London was also stopped before it could destroy the entire city. What is it? It's actually 1666. 
it is 1666 that we are talking about no 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 year of miracles is not this year of miracles anis mirabilis is not 1660 babita uh, and others it's 1666 Okay, uh, even if you were not aware about, you could have used the elimination method and come on to this. Which of the following works by Geoffrey Chaucer was written during the author's French period? It was written during the author's French period, which is the first period that we are talking about. Right, the French period is the earliest phase altogether. So there is a work which is written in the earliest phase. Earliest phase is roughly say 1368 to 1372. This is the earliest period. It's also called the French phase. It's also famously called as the French phase. What is the right answer here? Shikha, Annus Mirabilis is not restoration, Bachi. Annus Mirabilis is a work that Dryden is writing, which is which he's saying is the year of miracles, right? So London was saved from the Great Fire. London was saved from the plague as well. And what we were able to see is that the great uh, sort of Dutch, uh, so so a there was also a defeat of the foreign partner. The foreign uh, nation is also getting defeated, right? So that is the reason 1666 is the Annus Mirabilis or the year of miracles that Dryden is trying to talk about. There's nothing. Uh, correlated. Annus Mirabilis is a work of Dryden Shikha. Be very clear about all these concepts. By now, all these things should be very clear to all of you. Yes, absolutely right. Absolutely right. So, Geoffrey Chaucer's French period is actually associated with the Book of Duchess is there, right? House of Fame, Canterbury Tales. Canterbury Tales is a part of the English phase. This is a part of the Italian phase. Toilets and Crusade is also part of the Italian phase. Book of Duchess is a part of the French period. Book of Duchess is a part of the French period, which was written. Uh, it is written in honor of Blanche, the Duchess of Lancaster caster who died uh, the year before right uh, who died in the early part of the year so you're able to see that he was uh, also following the french courtly luck tradition altogether okay please remember that okay uh let's one uh let's just look at one more question which of the following is an unfinished story in the canterbury tales it is an unfinished story in the canterbury tales it's not a complete story in the canterbury tales it is not a complete story in the Canterbury Tales. Which one is not a complete story? It's an unfinished story in the Canterbury Tales. It's written in verse, right? Uh, which work are we talking about? Yes, absolutely right, Shalini. Philip Larkin is also writing Annus Mirabilis uh, because postmodernism is also associated with the element of intertextuality. Postmodernism is also associated with intertextuality absolutely right absolutely right yes cook's tale is the right answer cook's tale is the right answer so please remember that cook's tale is the unfinished story that we are able to look at let's just do two more questions who's the narrator of fires the plowman who's the narrator of fires the plowman fires the plowman fires the plowman who's the narrator that we are able to see the prologue of fires the plowman introduces the narrator will and will sets out to travel the world he's dressed as a shepherd he sees eight visions he is looking at eight visions during the course of the narrator narrative and this poem it's an example of christian allegory because will is representing human will will is representing human will altogether right so the narrator of the poem is will that we are talking about there are eight visions this question also comes in how many visions is he having eight visions last question for today i'll tell you why who is tasked with judging the debate in the poem the owl and the nightingale who is judging the debate in the owl and the nightingale it's a debate between two birds concerning their individual importance to mankind. Remember, the debate continues through the poem, and it ha in the end it has to, you know you have to uh, there has to be a judgment. Uh, submit you have to submit the judgment of Nicholas of Guildford. Um, okay, yes, absolutely right. Some of you have given the right answer. Rajeshri is right if she has given the right answer for this. Uh, so who is tasked to judging the debate? Nicholas of Guildford. Nicholas of Guildford. Nicholas of Guildford, right? Uh, Owl and the Nightingale, again, a Middle English work that we are talking about. You have a quick session at 11 o'clock where we'll just quickly talk about, uh, it's just a 10 to 15 minute long session. Probably we can take up five quick questions because at 11.30 I have another session, so I'll have to have a hard
hard stop there uh, but uh, we we can we can just like you know right now we are meeting at 11 am again on the youtube platform for a quick discussion on analysis if you have the time you can definitely join in but it's going to be like a super crisp discussion and we can also practice five more questions like we stopped at 40 so i can give you uh, questions number 41 to 46 uh, say or or probably 50 if time permits we can we can practice 10 quick questions as well during 11 o'clock okay so please tune in at 11 o'clock um uh... and i will catch up with all of you review everything that we have looked at today tomorrow like i said we'll start with a few theoretical concepts also we will of course have questions but we will also be looking at certain theoretical concepts particularly on poetry and generally there will be other questions to practice as well thank you so much everyone for joining in uh, take good care of yourselves uh, i'll catch up with all of you at 11 o'clock for a quick analysis uh, on the cutoffs uh, not much to say uh, in that particular regard because the cutoffs have been very transparent uh, but still we'll 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 very quickly quickly discuss the cutoffs for 10 to 15 minutes and then probably we can take up a couple of questions all right thank you so much everyone for joining in take good care of yourselves if there are any other problems please do keep us posted thanks so much for joining in uh let's just quickly end this session thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you anam thank you juhi mosmi aziz uh divyani nidhi suman zahida All right thanks everyone take good care of yourselves bye see you I'll catch up with all of you very very soon bye everyone <clears throat>